California this evening. If you are listening to this in India, as I know some of you do. Yes, I saw you log on last week. Good morning. Or, if you happen to be elsewhere, good afternoon. Welcome to Balance Point. I wish I had some witty, funny way of getting into this, but I have no witty, funny way of getting into this, so I'm not going to try to get into this. Yeah. Um, anyway, welcome to Balance Point. And as always, we are coming to you from beautiful, 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 especially on a day like this, North Long Beach. <laughs> now, there's something that a lot of people never thought they'd ever hear put together, beautiful in North Long Beach. But it is truly beautiful here because this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Anyway, welcome to Balance Point. And as always, we want to welcome our internet viewers who might be watching live, and we want to welcome those that are going to be watching on the uh, recording on truthcasting.org. And for those that are going to be watching on the recording on YouTube, welcome. Um, I do have an announcement for the YouTube viewers. I did not forget about you last week, but, well, I sort of messed up. I didn't make a local recording of last week's video. And so I'm still actually in the process of extracting last week's video for the YouTube viewers, but we will get that video up and post it along with this week's video. I hope, I hope, I hope. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, we want to welcome you to Balance Point. If you are watching on the video recording, you know, like on Saturday or Sunday, and you are free, we would like to invite you, if you are in the Long Beach area, to come join us. We meet at Light My Christian Fellowship, North Long Beach. Well, not North Long Beach, Cherry Campus. If you go to the North Long Beach campus, you will be at the wrong campus. Come to the Cherry Campus. We meet at 6465 Cherry Avenue in North Long Beach. Normally, we meet, now we meet in the main sanctuary. Some of you that are longtime viewers may actually recognize this room. We are back in the chapel for the next couple of weeks because of construction. But if you come to the campus, you'll see the gates open, and one of the doors will be open, and that'll be us. Um, in two weeks, we will be back over in the main sanctuary again um, in our usual location. We meet at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, or the chapel, basically the Cherry Campus, for praise and worship. And let me tell you, I wish you were here live for the worship today, because the worship actually ties into the message. Um, which reminds me, and I'll have an announcement about that in a moment or two. However, if you're not in the Long Beach area, but would still like to join us live, you can join us in our virtual sanctuary at balance-point.churchonline.org. The doors, the virtual doors to our virtual sanctuary open about 15 minutes before the service. And the cool thing about coming to the virtual sanctuary is it's just like being here. Um, we have greeters greet you. We have somebody, we have prayer team to pray with you. Um, admittedly, we are a small ministry, so when I say greeters and prayer team, it's really the same two people doing both roles. However, we do actually have people available. We have prayer partners. We have prayer warriors who can pray with you at the online sanctuary. And that opens up at about 15 minutes before we start here at 730 with the actual stream. Uh, for those of you that are new to Balance Point, we do have a ministry center where you can find the notes for the uh, sermons. And um, I do post the notes, although if you actually look at the notes and then try to follow the video in the notes, you'll notice that quite often I end up off in the weeds somewhere. However, I do make the notes available. I try to get them up onto the balance-point.org website, I try my best to get them up before the service, at least the afternoon of the service. Um, I'm trying to get better and get them up like a day before. Um, and if you'd like to be notified about those notes, you can obviously come to the balance-point.org website, register up, um, and then you should get notified. Um, the other thing you can do is you can, and I don't have the slide for this, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was going to do this, I didn't think about this until just now. The most reliable way, even though Balance Point has a Facebook site, due to changes in the way Facebook handles posts on uh, on pages, 
I don't rec I, I mean it would be really neat if you came by the Facebook site and you liked us. You know, just look up uh, Bounce Point Bible Studies on Facebook, and it'll bring you to our site. But what if you if you really want to know what's going on on Bounce Point, either directly come to our ministry center, or for updates for when I do posts and such, um, follow me on Twitter at Daniel underscore Hoyt H O Y T E on Twitter. And when I do post, I always make sure that I link back to Twitter, and that's actually a lot more reliable than um, liking us on Facebook. Although we would love to like, have you like us on Facebook. We'd love to have you join the community and begin a conversation with us. Um, which brings us to our next point. Balance Point is a church plant, and we are in the process of building a community here at Balance Point, both online and offline, and we would like to make an invitation to you. If you do not have a church home, we would love to have you come and join the Balance Point community. I believe that God is working here to build something that is very special. Um, and I know it's God because I've worked hard not to build this, and it keeps growing in spite of me. Okay? So... Come join our community. Come help us build the kingdom of God. One family, one person at a time. Um, but with that said, if you already have a church home where you are being fed and where you're being taken care of, where you're not being abused or anything like that, the best thing that you can do for Balance Point is stay in your own church home. Take some of the fire from Balance Point back to your church. But join our community anyway. And bring some of the fire from your church to Balance Point. Because you see, we here in the Christian community, we are not in competition. We are in completion. So, you know, we're helping each other build up the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. All righty. Now then, um, with that, Balance Point does have some needs. And uh, no, we are not asking for money because for the time being, Balance Point is still fully funded. Although I will give you a heads up that we are beginning to, because of the numbers of people that we are serving um, and the technologies involved and the cost of some of the technologies, um, we are beginning the investigation of a church charter <coughs> here in the United States, a 501c3. Um, our mother church has actually offered us the ability to take donations through their website, and they have a line item um, on our mother church's ledger. Um, we've not done that uh, because up until really the last few months, I really did not realize that God was building a church online. You know, this kind of, even though I could see the numbers, I could see the patterns of how you guys use Balance Point, it still didn't register until really a few months ago, really a few weeks ago. And so a lot of the normal things that happen with building a church, we've not done. Because we've always figured that Balance Point would be the kind of ministry that would come alongside the local church body. Um, but there's a new generation that is coming up that, I'll be honest, y'all don't set, some of y'all don't set foot in a church. And Balance Point has become your church. Um, we will strive to not become your mama's church, because we do take pride in the fact that God has grown us very uniquely, and we reach a very unique group of people spread literally around the world. Um, as I've mentioned before, Bounce Point is actually translated into over 40 languages. Thank you, Google Translator. <laughs> 40 languages. And in fact, it got to the point where earlier this year I had to move to using Google Translator because the translation program that we were using on the site had literally translated all of the pages, all of the posts, all of the sermon notes and everything. And when it all got into the database, we had over a quarter million translated pages. All I got to say is, dude, that was shocking to me. So... And it's all because of you telling each other about it. So how can you help Balance Point? Pray for us. 
Really, pray for us. We covet your prayer. We, we would like to pray for wisdom. We would love for you to pray for growth. The other thing you can do for Balance Point, tell other people, if you have friends that are afraid to go to church because they've been burned, you have friends that have been hurt by church, you have friends that just don't know, or they've been to church and they just don't get it, they don't understand. Um, our pastor, Pastor Larry, has paid Balance Point the highest compliment that I believe that he could pay us. He calls Balance Point the low-hanging fruit of the church. And we intend to stay that way. We want to be accessible to you. That's why we go through streaming live. That's why we make recordings. That's why we put the recordings out where you are. So the best thing you can do for us is you can pray for us and you can tell others about Balance Point. And with that, we're going to get into our message tonight. Uh, turn with me, or if you happen to be like me and a techno nerd, turn a scroll with me to Ezra chapter four. So if you're if you're a paper person, turn, and if you're a, if you're an electronic person, scroll with me. Um, this session, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, let me pray for you, Father God. We just thank you for this time in your word. We ask, Father God, that these would not be the words of man, but that these would be the very thought, the very heart of our loving Heavenly Father. Father God, we just ask in the name of Jesus for open ears, open eyes, open hearts to receive your word. We ask, Father God, that this would not be some theoretical word, but Father God, that this would be a practical teaching that your people can take from balance point and apply when they go to work, when they go to school, when they're just out in the world. Thank you, Father God, for the grace of your word and the mercy of your son. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I'm not going to lie to you. Ezra chapter 4 is a downer. It's the only way to put it. I mean, it totally ends on a down note. By the time this chapter is done, it's going to look like the work on the house of God is stopped. It's going to feel like the enemies of God have won. But you know what? Praise God. The best thing about chapter 4 is the fact that chapter 5 comes after chapter 4. And after that comes chapter 6. And as long as God is in the picture, what seems like the end is never the end. So if this chapter is such a downer, why bother studying it? I mean, really, why not just skip over this chapter? You know, let's just skip over this chapter and get to the part where God does his thing, God says the word, the enemies are defeated, and everybody lives happily ever after. Why study it? We study these hard sections because we re we live in real life. We don't live in the fairy As Jesus put it right before his crucifixion in John 16, 32-33, but the time is coming and indeed is here now when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone, yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. For I have told you all this so you may have peace. Because here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. I like the way the King James put that last section. In this life you will have many tribulations. Or as my previous pastor put it, if you live in y'all going to have the tribs. There's going to be trouble. And that's what this chapter is about. This chapter is in the Bible so we can know how the enemy operates. And further, so we can have an idea of how to overcome. Because how many of y'all know that God is an overcoming God? God said that we are more than conquerors. We are, we are hyper-conquerors through Christ who's in us. So does God put this chapter in here so we can go around cowering in fear? That everywhere we look, under every chair, under every rock, we're going to find Satan lurking, going, look, 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 look. By no means. 
By no means. God puts these kinds of chapters into his word so we can be on guard. So we don't expend time and energy fighting the wrong foe. Because see, Satan doesn't just come at us as Satan. He's going to come at us through other people. And sometimes we can get our eyes off of the fight and be fighting the wrong person. We start fighting that person instead of fighting the enemy. We are told in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take stand against the devil's schemes. We don't have the armor to fight men. Men are tools that are used of the devil, but our real foe is the devil. Oh, I got ahead of myself. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. That's our real foe. You know, our foe ain't, our, ain't Aunt Martha who's just going nuts on you. There's a foe behind the nuttiness. Okay? Your foe ain't your boss. But there's a foe behind that. And so with that as introduction, let's dig into Ezra chapter 4. Wow, that was a long introduction. But we're going to motor through this. Chapter 4, verse 1. When the, enemies of ben in when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building the temple of the Lord, God of Israel. I want to stop right here. <clears throat> First thing you got to notice about the enemy, he ain't dumb. He knows what you're doing. It says, when the enemies heard about what the Israelites are doing. Here's a clue. If you are moving, if you are working in the Lord's will, and you are following the Lord's laws, and you are loving the way God loves, the enemy knows who you are. The enemy knows who you are. If you are making an impact for the kingdom, the devil and his followers know about it. Okay? There are a couple of sayings that sum this up. There are no truly secret Christians. In other words, if you're a true Christian, you don't have to wear it on your sleeve because God's tattooed it across your forehead. Because you're going to walk different. You're going to talk different. You're going to act different. You're going to be more loving. You're going to be more kind. You're going to be seeking the good of those around you. And so, you become marked. Second saying, this is from um, Pastor Jim Reeve over at Faith Community Church in West Covina. If you're a Christian and the enemy ain't messing with you, you ain't doing much. If you're a Christian and the enemy isn't messing with you, you aren't doing much. Because see, if you're a Christian and you are moving in the will and the power of Jesus Christ, you are a danger to the enemy and his kingdom. You are a danger to Satan's kingdom and he will not let that stand. You see, it isn't that we have to run around beating our chest saying, ah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian that gets the attention. The fact that we're simply out loving gets the attention. The fact that we are in sync with the will and the word of God, which is out of sync with this current system of things that exists on this planet Earth, is going to get our attention. Because we're going to be marching to the beat of a different drummer. We're going to be walking down a different street. And when everybody else is going south, we're going to be going north. Now, here's the thing. The enemy will occasionally pretend to be disinterested in you, at least in the beginning. Because there's a good chance that 
like most people, you're going to get into your work, you're going to get into doing the Christian thing, but at some point you're going to get bored. And you're going to get tired. And you're going to go, God, I'd like to read my Bible today, but I just got to take a nap. God, I would love to pray right now, but I got to read this email. And you get distracted. So, you're being watched. When the enemies of Israel heard that they were building the temple. Second thing. So, once you're noticed, the enemy is going to come at your door. And it's going to come in the guise of friendship. And he's going to come offering help. Beware. Verse 2. Said, Let us help you build. Who came? Here's the deal. If you are truly moving, with the Lord, if you're truly rocking and rolling and you are truly doing your thing and you're moving, the enemy's going to come and try to delay you. This coming as a friend is nothing more than a delay tactic, a distraction tactic. There are going to be people that are going to come alongside of you offering their help. And while you think they're helping you, what they're really doing is they got their they got their spiritual shovel out and they're digging a hole up under the foundations that you done built, hoping that whatever you built will fall down. See, here's the deal. If the enemy came to us with a sign on his front, with, with one of those, hello, my name is stickers, that says, hello, my name is Satan, and I'm here to mess you up, how many of us will fall for it? None. And that's why he doesn't do that. That's why he doesn't do that. We recognize him right off, and we give him the boot of Christ. Be like, dude, you're here to mess me up. You're gone. No, he uses trickery to try to get in on our good side. He uses trickery to try to slip in under the radar so he can destroy within, from within. The history of the early church is a history of Satan doing that. First, Satan tried persecution. And so you end up with someone like Saul of Tarsus who went out and arrested and killed Christians in the name of the Sanhedrin. But then God got a hold of Saul, renamed him Paul, and he became one of the greatest weapons of the church. You have the various emperors and the various local rulers who sought to persecute the church. Then in the 300s, the enemy took a different tack. The enemy infiltrated the church. The 300s is when it became legal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. And what the enemy could not accomplish through violence and death and imprisonment, he accomplished by moving the church in a direction where it becomes the religion of the state. And so where he couldn't destroy from without, he corrupted from within. That's what this, hey, let us help you, is about. Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians about people like this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. These people are false apostles. They're deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. I'm not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get their punishment for their wicked deeds. 2 Corinthians 11.13 So what's the response to the enemy when they come at you saying, Come on, let's help. let us help you. We love what you're doing there. 
Let's help you. Well, the leaders of Israel shut them down. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the family of Israel answered, you have no part. You have no part with us in building the temple of our God. They didn't argue. They didn't reason. They just shut them down. Now, this takes a little discernment. They knew who their enemies were. They knew who their traditional enemies of Israel were. And so they knew to shut them down. Sometimes we don't know who our enemies are. So we don't always know that it's time to shut them down. You see, we don't argue with the enemy. We don't argue with the devil. He has the experience. He's been around a lot longer than I have. I've got 45 years. I have no idea how many years he has. So the Bible doesn't tell us how long ago God actually created this thing we call the universe. God, the Bible just says God created it. It doesn't say when. Anybody tells you that they can figure out when God created the universe from the Bible, I've got some questions. Because I'm not so sure. I know this, God created it. I don't know when he created it. So the devil has some experience under his belt. He also has resources. Even though the devil has locality, just as we have locality, we have a place where we are, the devil has something we don't. Legions of demons. The word says a third of the angels. Okay? We don't know how many angels a third of the angels are. But based on the book of Revelation, I can tell you there are 10,000 times 10,000 left in heaven still. So if the devil... Has, if that represents two thirds of the angels, that is one big number. That is one seriously big number. <clears throat> so he has resources. And because of that, if we try to fight him on his own terms, with logic, with, with, with our own mind power, with our own brain power, we're going to lose every single time. Okay? So how do we fight him? We have to have discernment. Which, by the way, is one of the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about discernment. And we need to see the Spirit behind what's happening. And as always, we do it in love. And our example is Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, Peter, Jesus just asks, Who am I? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the anointed Son of God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood haven't told you this, Peter, but the Spirit of my Father. So now he's gotten done with this, and Jesus goes into predicting his trials and death. And picking up at verse 23, right, at, right after he's predicted, Jesus, Peter takes Jesus aside and is going to rebuke Jesus. By the way, before we get on our high horse and go, oh man, that Peter, we do the same thing. Confession time, God told me to plant a church. I had an idea of what the church was going to look like. Y'all don't look like my plan. And I spent a year and a half telling God, this ain't the plan. God really, God really solidified that this was the plan over a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. I spent a year and a half going, but God, you told me to build a church. And this thing called Balance Point don't look nothing like a church. So before we get on our high horse and go, Peter, no, oh, gee, Peter, we do the same thing. We're not much different. But how did Jesus handle that? Verse 23. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concern. We confront the enemy. We confront the enemy. So when the enemy's trying to distract and destroy us, how do we deal with it? Well, one is confrontation. 
Other major way of dealing with it is remember what our purpose is. Remember our orders. Picking up at Ezra verse 3, 4, 3. We alone will build it. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as Cyrus the king of Persia has commanded us. When the enemy comes and wants to distract you and say, we'll help you. Well, in this case, the Israelites had a specific instruction from the king, a specific edict. Cyrus said, you who are of the children of Israel, go back to Jerusalem and build a house unto your God. The edict doesn't say, you're the children of Israel and whoever y'all pick up along the way. Doesn't say, you are the children of Israel and whatever ragtag, motley crew you can put together, go build the temple. We follow the instructions that we have been given. We stay the course in order to remind ourselves of where we have been sent to go and what we have been sent to do and how we have been sent to do it. With a clear vision of the goal set before us, a clear vision. So we have the instruction. We can see it ahead of us. It's easier for us to avoid distraction because that clear vision acts like the blinders on a horse. So we see directly ahead of us. And it allows us to cut through when the enemy is posing as a friend. Proverbs 29.18 speaks to this. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. In other words, where there's no vision, you get distracted and you go here, you go there, you go far, you go near, you go hither and yon. You know, you're just all over the place. It, it, it's like the story of the, the rabbit and the tortoise. The rabbit and the tortoise are going to have a race. The rabbit is heavily favored to win. So the starter goes on your mark, get set, go, and the rabbit goes, Poof. and the tortoise is just, Oop. yep. And the rabbit, he's running, and he's here, and he's there, and he stopped to smell the flowers, stopped to have lunch, stopped to take a nap, off the road, on the road, across the road, up the road, down the road, because he figures that he has so much speed, and he loses sight of the goal. The tortoise, he's just doo, 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 on up the road, keeping sight of the goal. And where the rabbit gets distracted, the tortoise passes him and wins the race. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. They're all over the place. But happy is he who keeps the law. <laughs> Because he keeps his eye on the prize. He keeps his eye on the goal, on the thing that God has told him or her to do. So the next tactic of the enemy is discouragement. Now, discouragement can come from within us. I mean, to be really honest, the enemy really doesn't have to work hard to discourage us because we do a pretty good job of doing that to ourselves. It can come from those around us. For example, in the previous chapter, we saw that the older ones who could remember the former temple, when they saw the foundations that were laid for the new temple, they wept. Because they were looking back at the glory days. Discouragement can come as a small voice inside of our head, the little tape that we play over and over again from somebody that when we were younger told us that we're not worthy, we don't have the skills, we don't have the abilities. Discouragement can come from outside, from outside interference, such as what happens in verse 4. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage them. How many of y'all know that when you are moving in the direction of God and you are moving towards what God wants you to do, that the people around you will say, why are you doing that? You can't do that. That's stupid. Why would you want to be going and doing that? Nobody's going to go to no church online. 
There's already too many churches in Compton. The people set out to discourage the people of Judah to make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials. So now they've ratcheted up a notch. They're bringing in the government. You can't pray on the street. Who gives you the right to voice your God on the rest of us? They bribed officials to work against them, to frustrate their plan. During the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, down through Darius, king of Persia. So what's the solution here? Armor up. We started the study with Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, the armor of God. I'm not going to read that here. Not going to because I'm running out of time. But if you look at the armor of God, the majority of those pieces have to deal with either our thoughts or our heart. Helmet of salvation protects the kanagan. Breastplate of righteousness protects the heart. Shield of faith protects the vitals. They protect your heart life and your head life. Man without vision shall perish. You have to protect the vision that God has given you for your life. And let me tell you, God has given you a wonderful vision for your life. For I have plans for you. Plans to prosper you, not to hurt you. Plans. Jeremiah 29, 11. The world says, the only plan for your life is you're going to have a lot of babies and be on welfare. No. God's plan is you are a princess of the Most High God. The world's plan, well, you're just a black man. You're going to end up in jail or dead. God's plan, I have made you to be the head and not the tail. The world's plan, you'll never end up being much. Your daddy was a drunk. Your granddaddy was a drunk. You're going to be a drunk. God's plan, be not drunk, but be filled with the Holy Spirit and power. Remember the vision that God has for you. Lastly, in this chapter, we come to the smear. This is a tactic of the enemy. You are doing good. You are being good. You are following God's law. The enemy has nothing that they can hang on to you. So what the enemy does is they tell the truth. But they tell the truth in a way that's a lie. Interesting. So what happened? The enemies of Israel sent letters to the king, accusing the Israelites of rebellion. Interesting enough, everything that the enemies wrote into these letters, I'm not reading them because we are really short on time. Everything that the enemy wrote in the letters was true. It was spun and stacked in a way to cast the worst light on the Israelites. Is it no wonder that the devil is called the accuser of the brethren? And the crazy bit is, he don't even have to lie. You can be doing good. What's the solution to that? Allow the Holy Spirit to guide our words and our deeds so that we live above reproach. I got a story about that, or actually God got a story about that. This is in Daniel, the book of Daniel, a few books later, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. This I am going to read. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, <clears throat> with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. By the way, interesting thing, by this point in Daniel's life, he's been through three government administrations. By rights, he should be allowed to retire. He's probably pushing 80 or 90 years old by this time. Okay? The satraps were accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now, Daniel was so distinguished among, his, among the administrators and satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. <clears throat> At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds of charge against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. 
Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Here's a clue for you. We're, if we're Christ followers, we should be like this. We should be so above repro reproach. If we're working, we give them an honest eight hours of our day for the pay. Unless you are a manager, in which case then you owe a fiduciary responsibility. That means that you owe a higher level of responsibility. So as we read through this passage, we find that even our good deeds will be spoken of as evil. So how do we overcome this? If this is a zero-sum game where you can't win for losing, how do you overcome it? Encourage ourselves in the strength of the Lord. Going back a few books to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 6. This is right after David was going to march out with the um, Philistines to fight against the Israelites. And the Philistine kings say, no, we don't want this Hebrew with us. And so they send David back to Ziklag. While they were gone, the Amalekites came in, kidnapped everybody, burned Ziklag. Everybody's bummed. They're about to stone David. Verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord. When the chips are down, you got to look up. I was very tempted because of this chapter to actually pull out an old song from my old church from about 20 years ago called Setback. And the chorus of that song goes, when you have a setback, don't take a step back. Be ready for a comeback. Why? Because in the setback, in what would be a stumbling stone for another person to the child of God, because all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes, the stumbling stone to the person in the world is a stepping stone for the child of God. Encourage each other. A little bit earlier, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 16 and 17. Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh and found him and helped him find strength in God. We should encourage each other with songs, spiritual songs and songs. Listen to what Jonathan says. Now Jonathan is the second in line to be king. Don't be afraid, he, that Jonathan said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I'll be second to you. Encourage each other. Okay, as a bumper sticker says, stuff's going to happen. The question is, what are you going to do with your stuff? Now, we closed our worship time with the song, No Weapon by Fred Hammond. I suggest that you go and find that on YouTube. Listen to it. I did that on purpose because this chapter is pretty damn. But I'm here to tell you, and I'm closing with this, there is truly no weapon, no plan, no purpose, no scheme formed by the enemy against the child that can prosper. This chapter is a temporary setback for the people of Israel. But guess what? The victory is coming. And I'm going to close with this verse, Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Here's the deal. That verse only applies if you're a child of God. If you're not a child of God, meh, can't help you. There's no guarantee. Only guarantees in life are that life's going to be tough to you. But the difference between the child of God and the one that isn't a child of God, between the Christ follower and the person that's not the Christ follower, is this. We know that all things work together for good. It isn't that all things are good, but they work together. For those that love God and are called by his purposes. So, here's the deal. Are you called by God? Yes, you are. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that anyone who believes on him should not perish but should have eternal life. You don't have to walk through this life alone. And today I'd like to offer you the opportunity 
to trust in God. Trust in Jesus. What does this mean? It's very simple. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus died for your sins and rose again from the dead, and you believe in your heart, you shall be saved. For it is with the mouth that one believes unto salvation. Okay, so what, what are we believing? Well, here, here's the deal. One, we're all sinners. It's a theological word. It means we miss the mark. We blow it. Okay? Two, we owe God a debt we can't pay. Three, God loves us. Four, for us to be with him, that debt has to be paid. So five, Jesus paid it for us by dying on the cross and rising again. Six, it's a free gift. All we got to do is say, Lord, forgive me. Come to my life. So on the very first day that the church was born, Jesus, Peter preached about the crucified Christ. And the people said, what shall we do to be saved? We are nearly 2,000 years later, and the question is still the same. What shall you do to be saved? It's very simple. Repent. Change your mind. And be baptized. I'm going to give you a chance to pray a prayer of repentance right now. That's you. If you've never trusted God, or if you once walked with Him, but you are now walking in your own ways, today's the day, and you're the person, you will make the choice, and God will make the change. Without God, you can't. But here's the cool thing God's already here, He's already waiting for you, He's ready. But there's a double edged sword because without you, God won't. You just won't. So I'm going to pray with you. Pray with me. This prayer is this is the first time we're recommitting. And then I want you to contact us at Balance Point. You can contact us at prayer at balancepoint.org. Or you can contact us at staff at balancepoint.org. But um, I want you to contact us and let us know that you prayed this prayer. So let's pray. Father God, I know that I'm a sinner. I miss the mark. I mess up. I blow it. I ask that you would forgive me. Father, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who died on the cross in my place. I deserve to be on that cross, but Jesus took my place. Thank you for that, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to live within us today. Help us to live a life of love, the abundant life. Holy Spirit, come and seal us. Again, Father, we thank you for this forgiveness, and we just pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, please contact us. Let us know that you prayed that prayer. Because the Word says that where two or more are come into agreement, a thing shall be established. You are one, and I am one, and I want to agree with you about this. So contact us. Staff at Balance Point, prayer at balancepoint.org. All right. So next week we're going to be getting into Ezra chapter 5. And until next week, be blessed and kept in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. Amen and amen. It wasn't a performance, it was a preaching. And I think it might have actually taken. Besides you and David? That means everybody's going to be on the... Uh,